Okay, this segment is cholecystitis or inflammation of the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis means gallstone formation. So some of the inflammation of the gallbladder is secondary to gallstone formation and they call that the calculus type. And there is also the type that is secondary to a stagnancy of the bile that's inside the gallbladder. And that's secondary to states where there is low flow, low perfusion, and that makes perfect sense. Things like sepsis, burns, um, hypovolemia, and other shock states. Okay, so here we see that there's gallstone formation that can occur anywhere in the gallbladder itself, in the cystic duct that's coming right out of the gallbladder, in the common bile duct. So when the bile backs up into the gallbladder and things don't pro propel forward, that's when you start to get um, the signs and symptoms. So let's talk about that. So this is a hepatobiliary organ, a GI organ. So of course you're gonna get GI symptoms and upset. So indigestion, um, nausea and vomiting. Of course, as a um, infection, you're gonna be diaphoretic, fever, febrile. The pain is right upper quadrant pain, sometimes right shoulder pain. So it differs from pancreatitis because that's on the left. So it's good to keep that distinction clear. Jaundice. Now jaundice is because bile contains that pigment bilirubin, which because it is not being secreted properly, appropriately into the duodenum, and it's an infected organ, that pigment that is in the bile is able to absorb into the central circulation, into the tissues excreted by the largest excretory organ, which is the skin. So the patients, depending on how much they've absorbed, will take on that yellowish hue. You can also see in the conjunctiva of their eyes. Now, this is also associated with that puritis that is secondary to the bile salts that are excreted. So whenever you think of somebody being jaundiced and having that bilirubin excreted, there's also that puritis that is um, going to also be uh, a problem. Now, when you do have bile and bilirubin in the system, anything in the system is going to go through to the renal system and it's going to pigment the urine. So these patients, if there is an ele elevated bilirubin, are going to have the dark, dark urine. Tea colored, it's often called. It's also considered frothy, described as, described as frothy or tea colored. Now, because this pigment from the bile is not getting secreted into the duodenum to pigment the stools, you not only get the dark urine because the central circulating blood is pigmented or has the bilirubin in it, but these stools are not pigmented. So they describe the stools as clay colored, but they're actually more like a grayish color. So if you're used to gray clay in your arts and crafts classes, then you'll recognize it right away. They also associated with what's called steatorrhea. Now steatorrhea is fatty stools. So when you don't have the bile to emulsify fats, which helps absorb fats, your fat that you eat is going to come out in the form of fat. So that's steatorrhea. You might want to Google pictures of that because it's quite interesting. Uh, bleeding. Now, why would that be? Let's think about that for a minute. If you don't have that bile to absorb fats and fat-soluble vitamins like A, E, D, and K, then you're going to be um, higher risk for bleeds. So that's uh, malabsorption of vitamin K. So let's talk about the labs. And it's important for you to understand that it's all going to be a differential diagnosis. In other words, there's not one lab value like pancreatitis, for example, you say, aha, the lipase is elevated, we've discovered it. In this case, there is not one that say, aha, we've discovered it, it's definitely cholecystitis. Really, you, you know, get the H&P from the patient and then an ultrasound will confirm that. 
but in evaluation of the labs, you may get some of these or all of these elevated. Definitely, you know, leukocytosis, or white blood cell count elevated, elevated bilirubin levels for sure. Now that could be on a on a continuum of mildly elevated to very, very elevated. And these all other non-specific ones, alkaline phosphatase, um, AST and ALT, which are the liver function tests, also called SGOT, SGPT, and I'm not gonna pronounce what those stand for because it gives you a tongue twister. And then if the pancreas is involved, then the amylase lipase will be elevated as well, but not if the pancreas is not involved. So that's important to understand that, you know, there is no one um, diagnostic lab to look at. Okay, let's talk about what we do about it. So there's two approaches if you're going to treat the patient surgically in removing the gallbladder. There's the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, also called lap cholecystectomy, and then there's the open cholecystectomy, and that is more of a um, serious surgical procedure. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy um, is associated with much less downtime, much less time for wound healing because the wounds are teeny tiny incisions that are in the abdomen because a kind of a scope is inserted to visualize what needs to be um, taken out here and it's the patient is not opened up. So that's less pain, less risk of post-op complications like deep vein thrombosis and post-op pneumonias and, and severe pain. The pain is milder and the main complaint post-op, the laparoscopic, is that because there is this CO2 gas in order to insufflate, in order to be able to visualize um, upon recovery, the patient does have that um, pain of having those gases rising up. So the pain is described anything from mild to pretty severe, and it could be anywhere in the back, under the scapula, um, right shoulder. So it could be uh, described as any of those places. So an open cholecystectomy is, is an actual surgical procedure where the patient is opened up and so the decision to do one or the other is based on a myriad of factors. You know, just a surgeon could discuss that with you. So um, with an open cholecystectomy, there is something called a T-tube that's inserted. So that is when there are gallstones that are sitting in this common bile duct. So CBD stands for common bile duct. And when that happens and the gallbladder is taken out, they put something in the common bile duct in the shape of a T, which keeps the common bile duct open so that some of the bile directly from the liver can drain directly into the duodenum and some of it can drain out into the drainage bag. So, until the edema subsides, you're able to have this patency of the common bile duct post-operatively. Um, so, you know, as far as, for, as far as a nursing standpoint goes, you have to always make sure you understand what you're looking for with any drainage bag. So you want to make sure that, first of all, there is output because sometimes no output is just as dangerous as when there is, you know, a copious amount of blood or something sanguinous. And I'm sure you would know that, that is an emergency, but also be aware if you don't see any output because then something is, is obstructed that's not normal. Also look at to what the appearance is of the output. You want it to be not sanguinous, bright red blood, but what's normal, certainly in the first 24 hours, is some serosanguinous and then the rest is going to be bile cover, colored and that serosanguinous is definitely going to wane over the days um, post-operatively. Okay, so certainly an NG tube um, to decrease any gastric secretions, allow the gut to rest a little bit for pain control, opioid versus non-opioid analgesics, so depending on how severe the pain is, antiemetics for nausea, 
keeping the patient in PO for a time, and then you advance the diet. Now, going home, the patient will be advised to be on a low-fat diet. Remember, fats uh, will require bile to digest and emulsify, so a high-fat diet is going to be much more difficult and be associated with indigestion and discomfort for patients without a gallbladder and also advising the patients to eat small, frequent meals throughout the day.